On Thursday, December 12th, the general rode out to his farms about ten o'clock and did not return home till past three. Soon after he went out, the weather became very bad, rain, hail and snow, falling alternately with a cold wind. When he came in, I carried some letters to him to Frank, intending to send them to the post office in the evening. He franked the letters, but said the weather was too bad to send a servant to the office that evening. I observed to him that I was afraid he had got wet. He said no, his great coat had kept him dry, but his neck appeared to be wet, and the snow was hanging upon his hair. He came to dinner, which had been waiting for him, without changing his dress. In the evening he appeared as well as usual. A heavy fall of snow took place on Friday, which prevented the general from riding out as usual. He had taken cold, undoubtedly from being so much exposed the day before, and complained of a sore throat. He, however, went out in the afternoon into the ground between the house and the river to mark some trees which were to be cut down in the improvement of that spot. He had a hoarseness which increased in the evening, but he made light of it. In the evening the papers were brought from the post office, and he sat in the parlour with Mrs. Washington and myself reading them till about nine o'clock, when Mrs. W. went up into Mrs. Lewis's room, and left the general and myself reading the papers. He was very cheerful, and when he met with anything interesting or entertaining, he read it aloud as well as his hoarseness would permit him. He requested me to read to him the debates of the Virginia Assembly on the election of a senator and a governor, and on hearing Mr. Madison's observations respecting Mr. Monroe, he appeared much affected, and spoke with some degree of asperity on the subject, which I endeavoured to moderate, as I always did on such occasions. On his retiring I observed to him that he had better take something to remove his cold. He answered no. You know I never take anything for a cold. Let it go as it came. Between two and three o'clock on Saturday morning he awoke Mrs. Washington and told her he was very unwell and had a ague or fever. She observed that he could scarcely speak and breathed with difficulty and would have got up to call a servant, but he would not permit her lest she should take cold. As soon as the day appeared, the woman, Caroline, went into the room to make a fire, and Mrs. Washington sent her immediately to call me. I got up, put on my clothes as quickly as possible, and went to his chamber. Mrs. Washington was then up and related to me his being taken ill, as before stated. I found the general breathing with difficulty, and hardly able to utter a word intelligibly. He desired that Mr. Rawlins, one of the overseers, might be sent for to bleed him before the doctor could arrive. I dispatched a servant instantly for Rawlins, and another for Dr. Crake, and returned again to the general's chamber, where I found him in the same situation as I had left him. A mixture of molasses, vinegar, and butter was prepared to try its effects in the throat, but he could not swallow a drop. Whenever he attempted it he appeared to be distressed, convulsed, and almost suffocated. Rawlins came in soon after sunrise and prepared to bleed him. When the arm was ready, the general, observing that Rawlins appeared to be agitated, said, as well as he could speak, Don't be afraid. And after the incision was made, he observed, The orifice is not large enough. However, the blood ran pretty freely. Mrs. Washington, not knowing whether bleeding was proper or not in the general's situation, begged that much might not be taken from him, lest it should be injurious, and desired me to stop it. But when I was about to untie the string, the general put up his hand to prevent it, and as soon as he could speak said, More! More! Mrs. Washington, being still very uneasy lest too much blood should be taken, it was stopped after taking about half a pint. A piece of flannel dipped in salvilatilla was put round his neck, and his feet bathed in warm water, but without affording any relief. Finding that no relief was obtained from bleeding, and that nothing would go down the throat, I proposed bathing it externally with salvilatilla, which was done. And in the operation, which was with the hand, and in the gentlest manner, he observed, "'Tis very sore.' 
A piece of flannel dipped in salvilatilla was put round his neck, and his feet bathed in warm water, but without affording any relief. In the meantime, before Dr. Crake arrived, Mrs. Washington requested me to send for Dr. Brown of Port Tobacco, whom Dr. Crake had recommended to be called, if any case should ever occur that was seriously alarming. I dispatched a messenger to Dr. Brown immediately. Dr. Crake came in soon after, and upon examining the general, he put a blister of cantharides on the throat, and took more blood from him, and had some vinegar and hot water put into a teapot, for the general to draw in the steam from the nozzle, which he did, as well as he was able. He also ordered sage tea and vinegar to be mixed for a gargle. This the general used as often as desired, but when he held back his head to let it run down, it put him into great distress, and almost produced suffocation. When the mixture came out of his mouth, some phlegm followed it, and he would attempt to cough, which the doctor encouraged him to do as much as he could, but without effect he could only make the attempt. About eleven o'clock, Dr. Dick was sent for. Dr. Crake bled the general a second time again about this time. No effect, however, was produced by it, and he continued in the same state, unable to swallow anything. Dr. Dick came in about three o'clock, and Dr. Brown arrived soon after. Upon Dr. Dick's seeing the general and consulting a few minutes with Dr. Crake, he was bled again. The blood ran slowly, appeared very thick, and did not produce any symptoms of fainting. Dr. Brown came into the chamber soon after, and upon feeling the general's pulse, the physicians went out together. Dr. Craik soon after returned. The general could now swallow. Calomel and tartar emetic were administered, but without any effect. About half-past four o'clock, he desired me to ask Mrs. Washington to come to his bedside when he requested her to go down into his room and take from his desk two wills which she would find there and bring them to him, which she did. Upon looking at them, he gave her one which he observed was useless as it was superseded by the other and desired her to burn it, which she did, and then took the other and put it away. After this was done, I returned again to his bedside and took his hand. He said to me, I find I am going. My breath cannot continue long, I believed. From the first attack it would be fatal. Do you arrange and record all my late military letters and papers? Arrange my accounts and settle my books, as you know more about them than anyone else, and let Mr. Rawlins finish recording my other letters, which he has begun. He asked, when Mr. Lewis and Washington would return. I told him I believed about the twentieth of the month. He made no reply to it. The physicians again came in, and when they came to his bedside, Dr. Crake asked him if he could sit up in the bed. He held out his hand to me, and was raised up, when he said to the physicians, I feel myself going. You had better not take any more trouble about me, but let me go off quietly. I cannot last long. They found what had been done was without effect. He laid down again, and they retired except Dr. Crake. He then said to him, Doctor, I die hard, but I am not afraid to go. I believed from my first attack that I should not survive it. My breath cannot last long. The doctor pressed his hand, but could not utter a word. He retired from the bedside, and sat by the fire absorbed in grief. About eight o'clock the physicians again came into the room and applied blisters to his legs, but went out without a ray of hope. From this time he appeared to breathe with less difficulty than he had done, but was very restless, constantly changing his position to endeavour to get ease. I aided him all in my power, and was gratified in believing he felt it, for he would look upon me with his eyes speaking gratitude, but unable to utter a word without great distress. About ten o'clock he made several attempts to speak to me before he could effect it. At length he said, I am just going, have me decently buried, and do not let my body be put into the vault till in less than two days after I am dead. 
I bowed assent. He looked at me again and said, Do you understand me? I replied, Yes, sir. Tis well, said he. About ten minutes before he expired, his breathing became much easier. He lay quietly. He withdrew his hand from mine and felt his own pulse. I spoke to Dr. Crake, who sat by the fire. He came to the bedside. The general's hand fell from his wrist. I took it in mine and laid it upon my breast. Dr. Crake put his hands over his eyes, and he expired without a struggle or a sigh. While we were fixed in silent grief, Mrs. Washington asked with a firm and collected voice, Is he gone? I could not speak, but held up my hand as a signal that he was. "'Tis well," said she in the same voice. "'Tis all is now over. I have no more trials to pass through. I shall soon follow him." Thank you for watching, and if you like and enjoyed the video, we have another first-hand eyewitness account documentary about President Lincoln's assassination and last hours.